This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, this will be my shortest introduction ever. Clifford Asnes and I just go over the entire universe of quant, factor, and value investing. It is a master class. And if you don't believe me, I'm just going to shut up and say, with no further ado, my conversation with AQR's Cliff Asnes. Let's start out a little bit going over some of your background. You get your PhD at the University of Chicago, where you are the teaching assistant for some obscure prof named Gene Fama. Tell, tell us yeah, about Yeah, I about basically that. discovered him. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I ended up at the University of Chicago. I was an undergrad studying business and engineering. Um, I decided I wanted to be a professor because I did a, did a job just for money, coding up uh, uh, studies for three Wharton professors. Um, I liked what they did. I said, how do I do what you do? And they said, go get a PhD. I said, where should I go? And they said, close the door because we were at <laughs> Wharton. Uh, and Wharton's a great school, but PhD program rankings can be different than... Sure. And they and uh, almost to a man, because I went to about 10 professors, they said, go to Chicago. Really? And I went. I, I, I mean, I got in. I went. Uh, and Gene Fama was the man. To say the very least. So your doctoral thesis asserted that consistently beating market averages was attainable by exploiting both value and momentum. In other words, you took Fama's... Um, value factor and added your own twist, which was momentum, which eventually became a Fama French factor, right? Uh, yeah. It, Fama French still don't include it in their official five-factor model. Really? Um, a lot of us think they should. Um, I think that's just a philosophical difference. Um, the way I always describe it is one of the scariest moments of my life was going into Gene's office. I was already his teaching assistant, um, uh, he, he had kind of agreed to be the, my dissertation chair, even without a, a particular topic, uh, and going in and saying, I want to write it. I wrote it. It was more than just this, but one of the main things I want to explore is the momentum strategy and then mumbling. And by the way, it works very well. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, there's this constant fight in academia. Uh, if, if you believe something works, does it work because markets are efficient and it's compensation for risk or for behavioral reasons? And momentum inherently, and I think we all knew this instinctively back then, it's very hard to come up with a rational story, mm -hmm. a risk-based story. And I was nervous because he's Mr. Efficient Markets and rational. Uh, and to, to his credit and my relief, he said, if it's in the data, write the paper. Um, and he was very supportive of the paper. He works very closely with Dimensional, uh, a firm mm -hmm. I admire greatly. Um, they don't give as much weight to momentum as we do, but they use it in their trading process. So I feel like I've won half the battle on that right. uh, over time. Um, the only thing you said that I might take a small disagreement with is consistently. We think value plus momentum has a really good risk adjusted return, makes money over the long term. But when you've gone through two year periods like the tech bubble and three year periods like 18 through 20, um, I think myself, my family and some of my clients might take issue with the word consistently. So, so let's let's put a little more meat on those bones. To define what we're talking about, you want to identify the cheapest value stocks, but only own those that seem to have started on an upswing. Yeah. That that seems to make some sense. Yeah, you're you're accidentally wading into yet another quant mm -hmm. controversy. Whether you need both these characteristics in every stock, or whether you can have some stocks that are great on one and simply average on the other, and and the portfolio comes out. But the intuition you're saying is exactly right. Two things at that point, the literature has advanced. This is like quant finance circa 1990. Mm -hmm. um, you may throw in the size effect, and that was about it. Which about, we're going to talk about in a little sure. a little while, because I've read some papers that suggest yeah, we're, it may not exist. We're, we're cynics about it. But, <laughs> but value, momentum, uh, and size, in the opposite order that I just said, time-wise, size was kind of first, then value. Uh, then momentum were the three biggies, uh, and they're still very big in the in the literature. Around 1990, value says in the original metrics, and I think they've advanced since then. Um, mm -hmm. Price to book was the famous one Fama and French used. Right. Um, they'll be the first to tell you they do kind of like it, but it has no special standing. It's basically price divided by any reasonable fundamental. So it could be price to sales, price yeah. to earnings, price yeah. to whatever. You'll get people disagreeing like crazy. At our firm, we prefer a broad 
tent of of giving we don't think we're particularly great at saying which one is the exact right way to do this uh but if you buy low multiples and sell high multiples um either in a long only beat the benchmark sense with an over and underweight and you you did the same thing everyone does and called me a hedge fund manager it's about half our assets okay about half our assets are really traditional uh we're money managers beat you know plenty of things don't let us short or lever or any of those hedge fund kind of things Mm -hmm. but the principle is exactly the same the overweight in a value strategy would be low multiples. The underweight would be high multiples. If you're running a pure momentum strategy, the overweight, and this is also momentum circa 1990, mm-hmm. would be who's doing better over the last year. It's that simple. I used to dismissively call it the two newspaper strategy. You needed a newspaper, a uh, recent one, and one from a year ago. Mm-hmm. It's better to have a computer because it's a little faster than you. But you, you look up and you buy what's going up. It turns out... This part is surprising. Both make money uh, over any decent uh, time horizon. Probably not surprising is they are, in geek speak, negatively correlated. If you are a pure value person and I am a pure momentum person, occasionally we agree. We may get into this later, but right now we're we're in more agreement than normal Mm because value stocks kind of have the momentum. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, the cheap stocks are cheap because – one of the reasons they're cheap is they've been losing. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're negatively correlated strategies. And uh, this doesn't create a 10 sharp ratio, but a holy grail of quant finance is to try to find two things that on average make money that hedge each other. And value and momentum do, whether it's relative outperformance against a benchmark or absolute performance in a hedge fund. Hmm. So, so let's talk a little bit about how you ended up launching a QR. Following your PhD dissertation, you end up eventually heading out to Goldman Sachs to uh, effectively establish their quantitative research group. It, that's that's it, though. I'm going to mend the story slightly because a few of those things happen more simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, I left the PhD program in late '91 to take a year off. I'm I'm now on year 32 of right. that year off, so. It appears to have taken hold. Um, so you're a PhD school dropout? No, I, I did finish the PhD. Oh, okay. Um, I, I went to Goldman. I had started my dissertation. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people leave intending to write a dissertation from a job, mm-hmm. and I don't think anyone, including me, you, uh, succeeds at that. Uh, uh, but if you've already produced like a first draft, it can be a couple of years in this process to finish it. Wow. But it's more yeoman-like work after the first draft. You're just responding to things, running new tests. So I had finished a first draft, went to Goldman to take a year with the concept that an option can only be worth zero. Let me see if I <laughs> – let me see. I intended to be a professor when I when I started out, but let me see if I like this. Uh-huh. Uh, after about a year, maybe about a year and a half, I stayed a little longer, I was really feeling like I, I should get back to, to, to some of the academic roots. I was – a fixed income portfolio manager and trader, which is a ton of fun. Uh-huh. I recommend anyone who does this stuff for a living trade an OTC market for a while um, to learn the good, bad, and the ugly of, 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 of what happens there. Uh, but it wasn't like whatever skills they taught me in the PhD program. It didn't feel right. I then got just very lucky. PIMCO out on the West Coast read the first thing I wrote in the Journal of Portfolio Management. Mm-hmm. Um, the exciting title was option-adjusted spreads and a steep yield curve. Um, there's going to be a TV movie uh, at some point. Who's going to play you in the uh, movie? Uh, That's the big question. I, I'm, I'm not going to be flattered, whoever <laughs> who, whoever it is. Let's just say that. Um, and, it, and they won't have any hair, which will be annoying because when I, when I wrote that paper, I had hair. Right. They liked the paper. They, they talked to me. They didn't even know I, did, uh, I was writing a dissertation on quant equities at night. Um, and they, they basically offered me a job to start uh, a research group from scratch. Ironically, given what happened later, long-term capital helped my life because circa that time, they were doing extremely well. And suddenly, you know, uh, all businesses, not just Wall Street, are something's doing great there. We need one of those. So right. the, the notion that we should have some academics um, uh, helping us out uh, was greatly aided by them. And I, have, I, I actually think there's some brilliant people, though obviously it didn't end well, there, so there's a little bit of irony that, that they help. But PIMCO was looking to start a group. I went to Goldman Sachs and said, I think this is the perfect combination. I get to do academic work, but in the real world, both in the sense of seeing if it actually works, and you make more money. 
Uh, anyone who tells you they do money management over being a professor and, and, and never considered that is probably not never, telling you Never enters your mind never, for a never, second. Not telling the full truth. Goldman um, said, uh, he, uh, unbeknownst to you, uh, we're looking to start such a group. <laughs> to this day, I think that's probably true, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that was reactive to me. or, or, or uh, But uh, they did say that, and they, they offered me the job, and I decided the weather in New York City is way better then Laguna Newport Beach, Beach. Cali Newport Beach, excuse me, Cali <laughs> California. I also chose Chicago over Stanford for right. PhD. So, so you don't care about weather, obviously. No, Chicago but versus Stanford. Um, I got into both. Yeah. They offered a stipend. PhDs are very lucky. They actually mm -hmm. pay you to go to school. Everything was the same, except Chicago had in its budget to give me money for airfare to go visit. That was it. Stanford didn't. And I had no money. So I visited Chicago. And not Stanford, and it was a beautiful spring day. Right. So I'm fond of telling people I'm the world's only person to choose the University of Chicago over Stanford on the weather. Based on the weather. I, I'm more intrigued by the concept of you uh, sort of uh, Bruce Waning uh, <laughs> fixed income during the day, and at night your yeah. equity work is your Batman. Yeah, that was tied for the craziest time in my life. Um, the other time, my wife and I, uh, with with you know, more her than me. We had two sets of twins, 18 months apart. Oh, my goodness. Um, and it was a ton of fun, but it was ridiculous. Yeah. Right? So the nocturnal activity was a little different than writing a dissertation. Uh, but working at Goldman um, uh, with, with, with four babies... Um, was very similar to writing a dissertation, which I, is kind of is your baby. I could, I can imagine. So, so we we started talking about AQR in '98. You leave Goldman to launch that. This is your 25th anniversary. Yeah, it's so amazing. first, congratulations. I like to say a quarter century. It has more gravitas. Okay, it definitely does. It's amazing how quickly a oh. quarter century goes by. That's the truly shocking thing. All the cliches, particularly about children, but about all of life. Um, they're cliches for a reason. Right, you right. wake up one day and you go, what did I do for the last 25 right. years? How did I, this happen? I remember about three of those years. Right. I'm fond of telling people I have a really good memory that extends to two periods, right. the last two weeks and high school. I think that's probably true for a lot of people. It, it just depends on where you peaked yeah. personally. <laughs> if you peak in high school or you peak in college, that's that's <laughs> where all your memories are most uh, vivid. So, so given... AQR has been around for 25 years. How has your investing philosophy evolved over that period, uh, assuming it's changed at all? Sure. And I imagine it has. Oh, it has, uh, but more has stayed the same than has changed. Um, adding new factors, measuring factors better. I don't think that's a change in philosophy. That's just applying the philosophy and digging deeper. Um, our general belief starting out with value and momentum at Goldman in, in, in the very early 90s, uh, expanding uh, along with the literature, some of which uh, some of our people have helped create, um, to other factors, low risk investing, quality investing, um, uh, fundamental, not just price momentum. So let, let, let's define those. Um, like I think we understand what quality investing is, but what is low risk investing? Low risk investing at its simplest, again, all of these, you get 10 quants in a room, which sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, um, they'll all have um, uh, different ways and different sets of ways to measure this. But at its simplest, uh, there's a paper by two of my colleagues, uh, Lasse Peterson and Andre Frizzini. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrea Frizzini, excuse me, I left out the last syllable of your name, Andrea. I will never do that again. Um, wrote a paper called Betting Against Beta. Uh -huh. um, and I forget Bab, how many years ago. Bab. Um, everything's three letters because Fahm right. and French name their factors three letters. Right. So now we all copy them. Um, and they'll be the first to tell you they were uh, essentially extending work of Fisher Blacks from, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, um, where he found that uh, in basic theory, the capital asset pricing model, you know, we all kind of learn third week of an MBA finance class. Bill Sharp. Bill Sharp. Um, uh, high beta stocks are supposed to return more on average than low beta stocks. And in fact, nothing else is supposed to matter at all. So it's, it's a one factor model. Uh, and it's admittedly simplistic. Uh, even the people who created it won't tell you it's the be all end all, but it, it's a very useful way to think of things. It gets you down to a very important concept that diversifiable risk you shouldn't get paid for because you don't have to bear. You get bared for risk you can't diversify away. Beta 
being a risk you can't diversify away because a lot of your portfolio is already long beta, right. should be paid. So the problem, of course, is in some sense, you could say beta is paid because stocks tend to beat bonds over the long term. But within the market, the so-called security markets line um, is pretty much entirely flat and has been in sample and out of sample for a ridiculously long amount of time in a ridiculously large amount of places, meaning low beta stocks have kept up with high beta stocks, which in the simplest theory, they're not supposed to. Um, you can use this in a number of ways. You can buy, you can make your portfolio out of low beta stocks, earn as much money with smaller swings. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a hedge fund kind of person, and you can use this in long only portfolios too, it's just a little more complicated. You can go long, low beta, short, high beta, but you better apply a hedge ratio. Mm -hmm. If you're long a dollar of high beta, of excuse me, of low beta, I, I sometimes get the sign wrong in interviews. Mm -hmm. I promise in real life when we're trading, we get the <laughs> no, sign dude. right like three out of four times. Okay. And that right. and that's Hope, a pretty good number. Hopefully right? everyone knows that three out of four is a joke. Uh, but you go long, low beta, short, high beta. If you did that on a dollar long and a dollar short, you just massively short the market. Mm -hmm. Long, low beta, and short high beta, the betas work. Right. Um, so you apply a hedge ratio, you short less than you long, and you try to create something about zero beta, and that has created a, a, a very, you know, like all these things, imperfect, it goes through bad periods, but a very attractive risk-adjusted return in and out of sample long term. And then you can get into theories as to why it works. So what where I was going to ask you is, if low beta returns just about the same or almost the same as high beta, why the complexity? Why not just own low beta? And it'll give you, on a risk-adjusted basis, uh, a better return well, than high beta. Well, absolutely, some do. Um, but if you want to create, if you're a, a hedge fund person trying to create an alternative investment that's truly uncorrelated, mm -hmm. low beta stocks are still highly correlated right. to the market. So by going long low beta and shorting a smaller amount of high beta, and this depends on your preferences and how aggressive you want to be. But you're you, eliminating that correlation. You can, yes, you can create a a. I, I'm always leery in saying uncorrelated. We're always I always want to put in the, the well. I we're striving for uncorrelated, but mm -hmm. the compliance officer in my head is saying sometimes <laughs> it doesn't come out to zero all the time. Right. But it comes out close. So you can create a very diversifying stream of returns. Where if you just want low beta stocks, you are creating a a more attractive stream of returns, but still extremely correlated to perhaps your other holdings. So, so it could be used in different ways. So I think when most people think of AQR, they think value shop. But as I'm doing my homework to prep for mm -hmm. our conversation and finding all my previous notes, you don't just wing this. No, I try not to. I, I've done it on a you know Ray Dalio. I just winged it with. But with you, I feel like I have to come in loaded for bear. Um, that's a, that's a good accidental Wall Street joke, right? On purpose, not so accidental. Okay, good. Um, I, you know, I, I have a whole. I have all these. I got a million of them. Right, right, I got them all teed up, waiting for you. So people tend to think of AQR as a value shop, but really, you're a deep quantitative shop with a lot of different strategies. Yeah. Let's it, talk a little bit about the various ways you guys invest money. Well, let me. Can I back up for a second sure. and talk about why people? think of us as a value Absolutely. shop? Absolutely. There are a few reasons. One is there was one point in the very distant past where it was much closer to true. Okay. Um, some of the things like betting against beta, uh, quality or profitability, carry strategies were additions over time. So anyone who's even, uh, not that people, a lot of people follow us, but anyone who's followed us from the beginning, it's not crazy that they started out thinking that. Also, I just wrote a piece maybe a few months ago on our website with the highly defensive worried title we are not just about value in parentheses except occasionally when we are because you do get these periods and value seems to be the worst culprit um 99 so right, even even half of your headlines yeah are, are hedged I, exactly. so you're a half hedge fund now uh, well you know it, it, remind me where we were because i'll go off on tangents like you do but <laughs> but but I do write a lot of hedge statements, and I'm kind of famous for my footnotes, both because I stick the humor there, but also I put in all the ways I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really not a compliance reason. I, I hope it's more of an intellectual honesty reason. Anyone who's sure they're right is very, very dangerous. The footnotes allow you to 
get past that point. Yeah. I, yeah. I love saying, first of all, we hate to kill our darlings, anybody yeah. who writes. But secondly, uh, you could very easily get stuck somewhere. All right, let me just throw this in a footnote, yeah. be done with it, and keep going. And it allows that, yeah. okay, I've no. cleared the road for the rest the, the, of my thought. The, the footnotes have three purposes to me. They're where I stick the humor. Mm-hmm. They are the hedges. Um, here are the ways that what I just said might have been bull blank, and, uh, and, and I could be wrong. And finally, they are sentences I love that my editor did not love. Right, where we can mutually agree that uh, that, that that it's worth a foot that it's worth a footnote. But this and piece- they just, by the way, your editor just yeses you. God, I got to deal with Cliff today. Just throw it in the footnote and keep going. Yeah. It, it, it's it, helpful to have a waste it, paper it, basket. I like use that. I used to use a separate doc that I would whatever it was something 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 edits yeah. so when I would get stuck I would let me just move the sentence this yeah. paragraph here cuz it's interfering with the narrative and almost anyone who writes will find like they want to make the argument seven different ways right. because <laughs> you want to you want to both both kill the counter argument and then jump on its grave for a while and anticipate a, other a good editor attacks. will say pick your one or maybe two best arguments and go with those right. um, and and footnotes again are useful. So digression aside, oh. let's go back to the multiple strategies. No, I'm I'm not done. I got to finish on more, on more digression. We're not all value. Yeah, all right, let's go. Um, this could take the rest of the time. I'm, I'm, no, I cleared won't. my schedule through dinner. We are multi strategy. We go through long periods, almost decade long periods, where we hardly talk about value. Mm-hmm. It's one. It's a relatively important factor, frankly, but it's it's not a it's not a majority of what we do. And we go through long periods. A good example would be post GFC through 2017, tough, where value tough was tough. Yeah, and we had a great, almost a decade because everything else we do worked. Mm-hmm. Um, profitability one, fundamental momentum one, low risk one. Um, we don't need value to work. A lot of that is because value lost over that period, for what I will call, and Gene Fama will have to forgive me here, rational reasons. Meaning the expensive companies, by and large, outperformed not on price, which they did also, mm-hmm. but they outexecuted. Um, they grew more in terms of earnings, sales, cash flows. If you are a pure value investor in a quant sense, just buying low multiples, you win on average because on average the price goes too far. The cheap stuff, and there's a risk-based explanation too. Sure. Again, I'm, I'm pissing off Fama constantly on this. Um, <laughs> It, it, but you, it, a big part of why you win, we think, is the expensive stuff is better. It's a better company usually, but not that much better. Not what's priced in. Mm-hmm. That's on average. Sometimes, thankfully, more less often than not, but still quite often, the expensive stuff ends up being worth it or more than worth it. And when that happens, the value factor, the quant value factor, very different than how a Graham and Dodd investor, and mm-hmm. we can get into this later, we'll use the term value, that'll suffer at those times. Pretty much the rest of the process you can think of, and we do it all simultaneously. It's not really like one first than the other, but you can think of it as trying to avoid a value trap. Is this thing high profitability with things changing in the right direction and low risk, therefore someone should pay a high multiple? And you want to avoid value just shorting that. That works like a charm in a rational market, in a bubble and here again, I'll, I'll try to make this the final time. I'm mm-hmm. a, a Gene Fama heretic because right. I love the man. Who, who, um, who specifically says, what's a bubble? Yeah. Um, I think I, 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 I'm somewhere in between. I think I've seen a few in my career. Uh-huh. I think they exist. I think they are far more rare than the way a lot of Wall Street refers to them. A lot of Wall Street will say a stock they think is expensive is in a bubble. Right. A single stock can't be in a bubble. Right. Um, it has, though I do think the tech bubble... Um, and and certainly by the by mid COVID, uh, we we were in a, 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 a various kinds of ki- kinds of bubbles. In a bubble, value loses, of course, almost by definition. People want the darlings, but they but the darlings are not the ones who are out executing. They're the ones with the greatest stories. Um, so the rest of our process doesn't protect us very much. Um, that is incredibly painful period for our process. That. Both this time, which I think we're still in the midst of, and 99-2000, we've more than recovered from. The round trip has been good, mm-hmm. but has led to some really tough times to wait out. Um, my holy grail would be to come up with something to add to our process that would do really well in bubbles, 
but not cost us money long term because I don't think we can time these. Huh. That's interesting. And I don't think I'll. I don't really think I'll find that. And by the way, um, this is self-serving. But if your worst times are going to be when everyone else is partying in a bubble, and your best times are going to be when that bubble is killing everyone because it's coming down, yeah. it's not a terrible property no, to have. No, it is absolutely not. So we're going to talk more about value and growth later. But since you brought this up, I want to just throw a couple of ideas at, at you about sure. that decade that followed the financial crisis where not only did growth outperform value, but really thoroughly trounced it. Yeah. So there are a couple of theories I've heard that I think um, are worth discussing. Uh, first, the decade before, at least the eight, nine years before uh, the financial crisis, value was winning and yeah. growth was getting killed. So you started from a relative uneven place. Maybe some of this was catch up. But the theme I kind of find more interesting is that prior to the financial crisis, uh, Wall Street and the markets had systematically undervalued intangibles yeah. like patents, copyright, sure. algorithms, et cetera. How much of that 2010s rally was catch up for by intangibles? It, it certainly could have been some of the early part. Uh, a lot of quants um, added adjustments for that along the way. Um, uh, most of us are not purists saying we're not going to change our models since 19... 90. Right. And the notion, for instance, that R&D that's viewed as an expense, um, maybe all of it, maybe part of it should actually be capitalized, right. which would go into book value and make, make a firm look not as expensive. So a company that spends yeah. a lot of money doing R&D is yeah. investing in the future. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think that, that maybe part of it, I think it's overdone um, in a few ways. One, it applies to more than just price to book but it applies most uh, uh, directly to price to book, where you're not capitalizing things like R&D. It can apply to earnings, but plenty of valuation measures it has no applicability for. Price to sales mm -hmm. is- is Shouldn't it, make it's, any difference. It's, I don't see where you think about intangibles. What's right. the price and now? What revenue is it generating? And those type measures did just about as bad as the ones that were uh, uh, contaminatable. Is that a word? I'm not sure, sure. it's a word. It is now. Um, but it is now. Um, <laughs> it, so I definitely think you want to account for that in places like price to book, in, in earnings, and I think collectively, not just AQR. Um, that has been an improvement to how we measure value, and, and the world has changed a bit. Uh, but we it, it, it applied, and caring about price versus anything, even if it were immune to intangibles, was not a very good thing until late 2020, uh, since the GFC, so about 11 years. So I don't think that, you know, w the, the real world's always more complicated. Everyone's always looking for single explanations right. when it's a lot of things way. have multiple explanations. So I think this can definitely be part of it, but I don't think it's the main driver. Yeah, nu nuance is wildly underrated uh, <laughs> in finance, to say the least. Let's talk a little bit about um, your research and writing, and I want to quote your favorite publication, the New York Times, who wrote about you, Quote, he built a public reputation for his willingness to write and say what's on his mind. In academia, he's known for witty, biting papers he writes for such publications as the Financial Analyst Journal. I know you don't write to do branding, but what do you personally get out of a fairly steady stream of deep, thoughtful academic papers? Well, first, you're being too kind. Of course I write to do branding. Okay. Um, I run a real-world business, and mm -hmm. I prefer people to think we're good at this. Um, and I think that's legitimate. That's fair. If, if I write something that people think is lousy or they disagree with or misses the point, it's going to hurt our business. Mm -hmm. So I, I won't pretend uh, part of it is not a business decision, but it's really not most of it. A lot of it is the DNA. Three of our four founders met at the PhD program at the University of Chicago. We consider writing academic or uh, often that, that kind of area in between academia and applied. You know, we've written a lot of papers in the Journal of Finance, the JFE, and that's true academ academia. A lot of our work shows up in great places like the Financial Analyst Journal and the mm -hmm. Journal of Portfolio Management, um, which is kind of the nexus between those two. It, this this will sound childish, but a fair amount of this is just personal consumption. We Meaning enjoy what? being part of that world. We grew up thinking part of the way you measure success is whether you influence the intellectual debate. Mm -hmm. 
um, whether, and, 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 and how you're regarded in those circles. And it's just part of our utility function. I do think a, a, a few things. First, I always point out, I don't know the exact breakdown, but a fair amount of what we do is public, but there's a fair amount that we think is proprietary. Mm-hmm. And there are things that I, 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 I would have AQR researchers hunted down and killed if they published. Oh, really? Yes. Um, uh, my compliance area would like you to know that I'm I'm speaking in hyperbole. <laughs> I would like you to know that I'm not. Um, but there are, there are things we think, you know, even if there are things we think the world will discover where you think you're somewhat ahead on, and we do try to walk that line on, but a lot of what we do is, you know, is the value strategy cheap? Um, someone will write a paper saying the betting against beta strategy is really all only small cap stocks, and we'll respond to that. So it's really not giving away some of the stuff, which I think does exist, that is really unique. It does go to our taste. And I do think, um, besides just the, the, the advertising aspect, I think one huge benefit to our business is we hire a lot of PhDs, including professors. Mm-hmm. We hire some full-time, and we have uh, very strong relationships where they work kind of half-time for us. Usually they get to work full-time for their school also. Uh, it's a great deal. Um, to say, they, they, yeah, get, they get to have multiple jobs. Um, and that's, of course, what they're doing for us is also what they're researching. It's, it's actually quite beautiful. I don't think we'd get taken nearly as seriously in that world. If Meaning we were, it would be a recruitment challenge. Yeah. You can say to a professor, you could write for your whatever you're working on, you can help yeah. us, and if you ever want to publish with it, us, we can we can it, play with exactly. that Exactly. It's absolutely twofold. They're allowed, again, within the stricture of if it's staggeringly proprietary, no, uh, but broadly speaking, uh, we're helping their academic career also because we're okay with them writing about a lot of this, and that's very attractive versus a firm that says you can't say a word. Second... I don't think we could have even access to these people to the same degree if we weren't producers as well as consumers mm-hmm. of this research. You get a different respect level when you're publishing, at least occasionally, in some of the same journals they are. And you've become enough of an institution that affiliation with AQR doesn't look bad on anybody's resume and vice versa. It allows you to have access to some of the top academics that are out there. Absolutely. Uh, there are exceptions. I think, you know, kind of near the end of 2020, maybe people were being quiet about that affiliation for a while. Um, <laughs> that but, was a short-term performance yeah, issue. No, no, I'm had kidding. nothing I'm to kidding. do with I'm your kidding. research. I'm kidding. I am, I am proud of the fact that I, I do think uh, a- AQR uh, on an academic resume doesn't, at least doesn't hurt and maybe even helps. I, I would I would say you're being um, humble beyond necessary. Uh, I, I can fake that at times. All right. Well, you know, if you can fake sincerity, that's that's you all you need, make. right? That's right. So let's talk about a couple of your publications that sure. I was amused by. In late 2019, you wrote, bonds are frickin' expensive. How do you invest around that thesis? Because, going back to the bull market and bonds that began in 1981... It felt like bonds were expensive throughout the whole 2010s. Sure. What made you finally cry uncle in 2019 and say, all right, no mas? Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to somewhat disappoint you saying we do not take very big bets on views like timing asset classes based on valuation. Uh, Auntie Illman and I wrote uh, a paper. I forget the exact title. I think one of them was called Sin a Little, uh, where we say – Timing the market, and this applies to the bond market as well as the stock market, is an investing sin, and ultimately we recommend you sin occasionally and a little. Barry, not, not, oh, not that I've done all my homework, yeah. but that was November 7, 2019. You know Quote, it's so much better it's than time me. to sin. Oh. Well, I've researched it recently, and okay. you wrote it three years ago. I, so. I, I'm actually bad at keeping the catalog of my own work. There's, there's a lot going on here. The one you're referring to was about value timing. Okay, um, as opposed and, to... And it's really the same concept. We do believe that when that if you systematically follow a, a legit, meaning you're not forward-looking, you're only looking at backward data, mm-hmm. try to time the, the stock market, the bond market, or even value based on how cheap or rich it looks, they usually have very, very modest, positive long-term risk-adjusted returns. As you said, you can go through long, long periods long. where... They're overvalued and get more overvalued. Right. Um, we do use valuation in in concert with things like momentum and profitability and things where where 
now it starts to be better because it's negatively correlated to those. And, and all else equal, if you have momentum and you're not overvalued, Timing it may, it may is be irrelevant, better. right? Uh, if, you, if you're if you using momentum, how much does timing yeah. really matter as now, long as they're going it, your way? Because it's in there with momentum. Right. Um, that piece on bonds being freaking expensive, mm -hmm. um, which is going to eventually be a technical term. Right. I'm going to push it. That, I, I stressed in there, I don't know how to time this. Um, this is a five to ten year view. I know I tried various methods uh, you, uh, of, of looking at bonds. This was well before the yield back up and well before the right. inflation spike. Um, compared to any forecast or trailing version of inflation and doing that consistently through time, bonds were about tied with giving you the least they've ever mm -hmm. given you. Uh, and tied for worst is, I think, expensive. Okay. How someone reflects that, if they are taking a long horizon – now, uh, we can get into the TINA. There is no alternative. Uh, equities didn't look great either. Um, I think a lot of why we publish these long-term forecasts, and my colleague, Antti Ilmanen, is really the master of this, is both we're interested in it and our clients really seem to value it. But we don't trade on a 10-year forecast. Right. Um, let me give you an example. A 10-year forecast, let's say you have value has power, and that's even disputable, but we believe it does. Uh, to tell you, is this going to be a better or worse than normal 10 years going forward? Very often, the answer will be, we predict positive returns, but considerably less than history. Okay, what is, do you do? Are you just hedging, or is that a genuine No, that's prediction? genuinely often a prediction from a from a model. Sort of like the 40% number. What yeah. are the odds of this happening? 40%. Yeah. You can't be wrong when you say yeah, that. Yeah, this stuff is always wishy-washy. You know, statisticians never say we know this. They say the chance we're wrong is 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 small. Um, but it's also intellectually accurate. You don't mm -hmm. ever know something. But imagine you have a forecast. Stocks usually make 10% a year. Um, and don't hold me to any of these numbers. We think they're going to make 5% a year. Um, but not negative. You know what? Someone is someone who shorts for the next 10 years or underweights against a, a benchmark. Mm -hmm. you, you know what happens if you short a positive but smaller than historical return? You lose money. You lose <laughs> less than you would over history. And you get to go to your client after 10 years well, I lost you money for a decade, but the good news is I lost you less than I would have used lost over the average decade. And it's a good example where forecasting the 10-year period can be interesting and can be vital, mm -hmm. right? If you're anywhere from an individual to a pension fund saying, how much do I have to save to retire? What you're going to earn on that money is an important number, but it's not necessarily a timing actionable number. For years, my dad, it was on, it was in the spreadsheet, it was a little piece of paper, and it was probably calculated all wrong because, believe it or not, my dad was a numerate. Mm -hmm. um, my mom was a math teacher, so okay. I got it from somewhere. But he had that little sheet, what do I need to retire, which I think everyone has in some extent, uh, including institutions. So we think that number is really important, but I, I do not recommend trading on just valuation, except that sin a little. When things get... I like to joke to the 120th percentile. Mm -hmm. um, the joke, of course, is there's no such thing right. as the 120th Meaning percentile. Meaning this is beyond our lifetime but experience of... It's, yeah, it, it's beyond anything we've seen before. Mm -hmm. It would have been 20% above the prior 100th percentile. It's the new 100th percentile. And we've really tried hard and we can't find any rational reason for it. A small move. Don't be a hero because, again, these things can get crazier and crazier. That's the sin a little. We recommend sinning a little and occasionally... I recommend that, Barry, in your personal life also, mm -hmm. in a very different context. You can apply that any way you, <laughs> you would like. Um, and so at that point in 2019 with bonds, I think we would have told people we probably own a drop less than, than normal on a really long horizon. But mostly we're telling people, assume you're going to make less. Now, the, uh, the late 2019, um, uh, uh, it's time for a sin. I think it was. I think I tried to use. Is it is it pronounced venial or venal? Uh, a, a mild sin. Venal. Um, you got you got two you got Venality? two Jews here. We need a yeah. Catholic. Right. Um, the it, 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 what I basically said. It's time for a. a I'm going to say venial value sin. Mm -hmm. A venial value timing sin. Um, and I was looking at the spread between cheap and expensive. What we, I want to say we created this. That is probably false. You never know who created things privately and didn't share them. We were the first to publish on this, uh, and it was back in the tech bubble. This is a 24-year-old result from 1999. 
very similar period to to particularly 19 and 20. Mm -hmm. Value killed, we think irrationally, so the other parts of the process don't help. Extremely painful, huge recovery uh, afterwards. But during the teeth of the pain, we wanted a measure of how extreme it is. And you can't always just look at returns. Returns tell you the pain you're in, but if those returns were, say, justified by massive you, you know, earnings growth, right? If your earnings double, your PE stays the same, and your return is 100%. Um, and that didn't make you more expensive. It just was a great result. Mm -hmm. And some of that can always be in there. So you want to be prospective. So we built this measure that was very simple. All the academic and applied work that was published at the time sorted stocks on valuation measures, generally went long or overweight the cheap and short or underweight the expensive, mm -hmm. and really never addressed how cheap and how expensive. You always get a spread. I'm fond of saying otherwise your spreadsheet is broken, mm -hmm. or every stock is coincidentally selling for the same price to right. sales. Right. But sometimes that spread is huge, and sometimes it's very tight, and it does correspond to times that would intuitively strike you as frothy. So frothy the wider the spread, the more attractive the valuation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the lower value, the value stocks versus the growth. Value stocks. looks better versus growth mm -hmm. on a three to five year horizon. It's also not, pure value is never a great timing tool. I think you do put yourself on the right side of so-called catalysts when valuations are that extreme. A uh, bad catalyst for you will hurt a little and good catalysts will help a lot. Uh, but but it but it's still um, I wrote this in late 2019 because spreads were approaching something I never thought I'd see again. Back were, to 99. They levels. were approaching the tech bubble peaks. Really, that's shocking. Yeah. In 99, before the what do we have off the the pandemic lows, a 68 percent gain yeah. in the S and P, and then the next year another 28 yeah. percent on top of that. So this is late. This is this late, is late 19. 19. We were not there yeah. yet. Yeah. And I'm talking about the spread between cheap and expensive, not not the whole market. The, the entire market, if you like a Schiller cape or something, was much worse mm -hmm. in 99, 2000. It hit about 45, where it hit the low to mid 30s at the peak in 2020. How do you use Schiller cape in your work? Same, I know a same lot of way. people are kind of uh, Same shrug. way. Um, shrug emoji. Some indicator ah. that when the Schiller cape is very high, the PE is very high, the 10-year perspective returns are low. We don't actually go short something because of the Schiller right. cape. It seems like it's been on the high side for decades. Yeah, That's one of the main ones Auntie and I look at and saying it's pretty hard to make your money actively timing based on only the, mm -hmm. the Schiller cape. It is much more reasonable to have a valuable 10-year modification to historical norms because the Schiller cape is high or low. But in, in late 2019, I wrote this. It's time for a venial value timing sin. I wrote that I'm ignoring momentum or trend here, um, which is against a lot of our philosophy, and, and and largely because I thought this was epically crazy, and it could come back very, very quickly. Just because on average, mm -hmm. trend and momentum work on average. You want to be able to do something that works on average many, many times. You only had one shot at this, right? If this came back in a three-month melt-up for value stocks, you could miss a lot of it if you if you didn't do this. Um, so, uh, and it turned out if I had listened to trend plus value, mm -hmm. it has worked out well for us. It would have been even a little better. So there's a little bit of a moral story. I give you my faults as well as my, right. uh, but I wrote this thing. And then about, I don't know, four or five months later, I wrote a follow-up piece saying no sin has ever been punished <laughs> this violently and this quickly. I recall that. I, I will make uh, an excuse, but I think as excuses go, it's one of the better ones. It's yeah. called COVID. Right. Um, uh, certainly, uh, that was not in my predictive power. Um, also, I think the market reacted ex post certainly crazy to COVID. Uh, basically, you remember, um, all you needed to own was Peloton and Tesla, and value stocks were going to cease to exist in the lockdown. Well, Tesla started running up in anticipation yeah. of being added to the yeah. S&P before and, COVID and, and then and just really stopped. went next um, level. Though, though value, as we or almost anyone else measures it, was destroyed mm -hmm. over the first six months of COVID. And it turned out not to even be directionally true. The value stock's fundamentals, what I call them executing outside of what the market cares about, just executing in their companies, right. was actually strong, uh, even including the pandemic. So the, the fear did not materialize. We thought those spreads got crazy, but they... As opposed, as opposed to approaching te tech bubble highs, 
Never thought I'd see in my career again after the tech bubble. Admit I got that wrong. They blew past it, well past it, when COVID hit. And we stuck to our guns and even added to that tilt Mm -hmm. a bit. We tried um, basically any explanation that someone from the outside, a strategist, a pundit, a client, a, a consultant, or internal that we could come up with for why we might be wrong. You know, the way I think of these is you got to keep a really open mind, consider why you might be wrong, test that story, and if at the end of the day there's something that's unprecedentedly crazy looking and you have, after keeping that open mind, rejected those stories, for then you got to plant both feet and say, I will not be moved. Um, and I think we've gotten pretty good at that over time. I, I never wanted that. Uh, one thing you asked earlier about investment philosophy changing, and mm-hmm. we went off on 20 other fun tangents. One major way my investment philosophy has changed is at the beginning of my career, 30 years ago, really, if you go back to the the Goldman days, if you had asked me what will make a great investor, quantitative in my sake, but in general, I would have probably given you an arrogant answer that, oh, just being smarter than other people, um, uh, uh, you know, being smarter than other investors, than the market as a whole. Um, the ar- arrogant part is the implicit assumption that kind of comes along that I'm one of those people. At the, mm-hmm. I, I still think this is a bold statement. Smart is good. Um, I don't. <laughs> I haven't changed the sign on smart, uh, but I now think long-term success. Half the battle is after keeping that open mind. You can't skip that step. If you decide you're right, having an extremely ordinary stick to itiveness to you is an equal partner to being smart. All right, so I'm going to just edit what you just said for a moment because I understand exactly what you're saying, but I want to rephrase it. So intelligence in the market, those are table stakes. You have to assume everybody you're trading with and against is intelligent. Even if it's not true, you have to assume that that's what's on the other side. Hey, I don't know who's on the other side of my trade, but I'm going to assume they know at least what I know, if not more. What you're also sort of suggesting is you have to learn when your high conviction trades become, I got to stick to my guns and ride this out. Even if I'm wrong for a quarter or more or four, this will eventually work out. Or 11. Right. Um, Because I know these numbers precisely. mm -hmm. Because uh, drawdowns have this amazing subjective, we borrow the term from physics, time dilation, even though we use Mm -hmm. it differently, where... You will look at a if you look at a back test or even real life returns, and you see a pr- fairly horrible drawdown, but you know it ends well. You you look at it and go, of course I'd stick with that. It's a great process. Look look at what it delivers. Two three years as some of these can take, they are an eternity. Um, you uh, everyone wants quarterly numbers, which means you've gone back to people eleven times, twelve times, and said, oh, we stink again. It becomes a proof statement. The world. And, and your show is a partial antidote to this, uh, but the, the, the financial media does a great job of coming up with stories why whatever's working is the truth and whoever's losing right. is— The church is what's working yeah. right now. Um, so you're defending yourself. Uh, you, I, I do think we've done a great job of sticking to our guns at these times, but I do worry that some years at the end of my life have been used up. But in, what's, the, in, what's the quote? There, there are some days that last decades yeah. and some decades that— well, we we talked about children. That's an example of decades that go by in days. Mm-hmm. Drawdowns are an example of days that go by. Right. Days are long and decades are short. It, it feels far longer than it really is in what I might call, I don't think there's a real term, but statistical time. Right. When can you actually say this is wrong? Um, it's and, pain time. When you're yeah. in pain, time goes much more slowly. Time flies when you're having yeah. a good time. And, the, and this is the inverse. And, and this, is, this is perhaps self-serving, but this, this raising a, a, a rational, after being open-minded and cynical, stick to to half the battle is also why I think some of these things last and don't get arbitraged away and are real. Um, as late as 2017, which again was a bad period for value, but a very good period for us and our firm grew, mm-hmm. most common question I'd get, particularly in public forums, would be, and it's an intelligent question, if this is as good as it looks like, why isn't it arbitraged away? And I literally, I I did not expect or want to be as right as I was over the following three years, Uh but I would say, 
uh, particularly having lived through the tech bubble, you have no idea how hard this is, can be to stick with at times. It is not that easy. It seems easy now um, over full cycles. Um, and I, I am schizophrenic about this. Half of me hates it because these times are hell. But half of me realizes that if they didn't exist, right? right this every value manager on earth and this probably applies to non-value but this is the people i every, talk to every discipline on yeah. earth in finance anyway i'm going to i'm going to steal your line you don't get the full glory of the upside mm. without suffering through the no. out of favor downside no uh wes gray someone you and i talked about before we started um uh has has a great uh, I think it's Wes's term. It is Wes's. I um, know exactly no, where you're no going to go. No pain, no premium. Oh, no. I was going to say even God would get fired oh. as an active manager uh, okay. is and a line Corey from Hofstein Wes. Maybe who said no pain, no premium. Um, I'm not good at uh, – I'm, I'm good at offering attribution. I'm not always good at accurately. Getting it right. <laughs> but they're both awesome. So. Yeah. Um, but I do think there's truth to that. I My favorite story, which I'm going to make you listen to now. Okay. This is from the tech bubble. Mm -hmm. I am probably late 99, early 2000. Um at home at night talking to my new wife, and I'm whining and and worse than whining. I'm cursing up a blue streak about how stupid and crazy this this world is, none of which I can repeat, even with the laxer laws today <laughs> on George Carlin's seven words. I still wouldn't go through what I was right. screaming that night. And she said to me, she only said one sentence. The rest was implied. She said, I thought you make your money because people have some behavioral biases and <laughs> And the rest is implied. She, she's saying, but when those biases get really ugly and they re make really big mistakes, you whine like a stuck pig. So you, wait, you're a quant and your wife is a behavioralist. Is that, is that <laughs> my right? My wife uh, has a master's in social work. So oh. I guess I guess behavioralist is accurate. And anyone who's been happily married, which I'm going to assert she is, and she can rebut if you invite her on, uh -huh. um, to me for, 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 for a quarter century, is, it, it has to be a bit of a behavioralist. Right. Um, but what we all want, which we'll never get, is a world where there are opportunities. We're active investors. We think we make the market a more efficient place. We think we make capital markets better. That's important for society. But we exist to a large extent to take the other side of errors and, 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 and correct that. We don't want a world with no errors because there's nothing to do. We want a world where there are significant errors. And after Barrier Cliff puts the position on, 11 minutes later, the market realizes we were right and hands us our money. That doesn't work that and way. And it doesn't work that right. way. It is p almost perfectly calibrated to make sure most people can't do it. Um, I, I like that phrase. It, it, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's almost perfectly calibrated. <laughs> the, the countryside is littered with yeah. people. My, by the way, I don't know how much, I know you spend time on Twitter, we'll talk about that. On investment TikTok, which has since shrunk dramatically, I loved- it's shrunk. In, I never got on investment I, TikTok, I thank loved, God. Uh, well, I, Access it via Twitter. Do you but, do you like rap your stuff on investment no, TikTok? No, never. Do you, never. Do you maybe put it to a Sinatra melody? Might be more appropriate no, what, for you. What I love is so what what TikTok calls investing TikTok. I call Dunning Kruger TikTok. <laughs> and my favorite is the young couple, both good looking people. Um, well, why wouldn't you choose the good the people? way we the way we make money is we only buy stocks that are going up. And once they stop going up, we sell them. And that's how we subsidize our whole lifestyle. I am not paraphrasing. That is like a verbatim well, quote. As as one of, uh, Jagadish and Tipman are the two um, uh, academics who really deserve pride of place on momentum. But as one of the very early discoverers of momentum, I always got to give them the, there's a little truth to what they're saying. But they don't do it, in a, they tend to do it in a very disciplined way. And very often, um, individuals and institutions and professional investors tend to be what I call momentum investors at a value time horizon. They look at something that's okay. been strong for three, five years, and they go, it's got to keep going. And at that time horizon, you want to be a contrarian, mm -hmm. not a momentum investor. So I feel obligated as, as a co-author of some of the momentum stuff to defend that a little bit, but this is not adding up well for these people, I promise. Um, one last thing ab uh, about it, a running joke I've had for years is people – in describing this kind of thing, often subtly use the wrong tense. Mm -hmm. They talk about buying what has been going up 
but the implication is it is, it is going up. Mm-hmm. And you just got to watch your tent. It's very easy to identify what has going up, and it's part of our process. Right. By the way, I would not be a pure momentum trader. Um, momentum has uh, what the geeks will call a very bad left tail. Uh-huh. Uh, some famous periods of reversals in market, the most famous being spring of 2009 when we came off the GFC. Yeah. For multi-factor, it was actually a nothing. Value did well enough that it was not a particularly... But if you were a pure momentum investor, that was a very, very ugly period. So in another way, I think this couple that I've never watched is probably getting it wrong. Yeah, to, to, to say the very least. So I could talk about your publications forever. There's a few that I feel like... I, I, why don't I throw three or four at you Go ahead. and you tell me which ones you want to talk about? Stock options and the lying liars who don't want them. Stock buybacks, unmitigated good or incomprehensible evil. That's a paraphrase. Okay. Uh, AQR's own research has disproven the size factor and undermined long-term investing, or four, what is volatility laundering? Okay. I mean, I'm gonna that's try. three hours worth I, of I'm material usually, right there. I usually lie about this, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to try to be quick and just go, go through them. Stock options and the lying liars who don't want to or won't expense them. I forget the exact yep. title. It was a play on an Al Franken book back yeah. in the uh, back in the time. I think Rush Limbaugh was the was the was the villain in in, in his title. Um, this was particularly post tech bubble. There's been this issue forever that stock based compensation, be they options or uh, particularly if they're options, are not considered an expense of the company. That it. The paper I wrote does this uh, beat to death. Let's look at the 22 ways you could argue this and why they're all stupid. Right. The best argument is the simplest one. These people accept a lower salary and want these things. Obviously, they're costly, <laughs> they ultimately to shareholders. Mm-hmm. Um, what's a little sad, I won't go through all the other subtleties. Um, what's a little sad is we kind of won the battle in that uh, uh, current accounting standards make you expense stock options, and that was a change. Uh But we also lost the battle because plenty of firms, particularly in the tech world, still issue kind of pro forma uh, earnings that don't expense them. And a lot of Wall Street analysts, to their shame, in my Mm -hmm. opinion, let them get away with it and use those numbers. Hmm. Uh, They're just not real. Let's go to one of your favorites, buybacks. Uh, Buybacks, uh, you gave this uh, Manichaean evil or good, right? my position's actually, I, I don't say it mildly, but much more mild than that. Uh-huh. My position is they're largely a nothing. Um, really? They're largely um, very close to a dividend. Uh, you can say, and some, you can argue they're- A more tax-efficient dividend? More tax-efficient dividend. And by the way, I don't take a great stance on how they should be taxed. That's a separate issue. Uh-huh. I take a stance on the idea that they're evil. Um, and by the way, th- this is one of the fun ones today. Because it's horseshoe theory. Both the left and the right hate buybacks. Yeah, now, it's kind of interesting, it's, isn't it? It's just, uh, you know, for different levels of, of innumeracy and paranoia, um, they think this is just a scam. Again, there could be 40 arguments for why buybacks are neutral and are not the evil thing you think about. Let me about. give you one argument. Sure. In a world where some companies do buybacks and other companies don't, Companies that do buybacks tend to perform better than the ones that don't. They, that's been a very mild effect, but it has been true, uh, and it's been a relatively short-term you, effect. Now, is it, whether it's causation or correlation is a whole other yeah. conversation. If it is causation, uh, the most likely estimate, which is not crazy, is management has more right. information than you do about about the stock. And by the way, if they if they if they do believe the stock is undervalued, and very often this is public information, they're just saying we're really undervalued. Right. They should be buying things back. Um, the, it's voluntary whether you sell, and those who don't choose to sell will benefit from that. So I have I have no problem with that. It it, it is a relatively small effect. That's interesting because the- you you make such a. I've watched you. You and I have debated it on Twitter, but I've watched you, and I'm not so far from your position. But I've watched you demolish people on Twitter. As if it's a giant. Hey, this is like the value effect. It, okay. It's no, much it's, smaller it, it's, than that. It's much smaller. If I've done huh. that, that is one of my many Twitter exaggerations. I will not claim that I always keep a calm head on on Twitter. Um, but the the simplest way to explain it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, let me give you two quick ones. One <laughs> is most of it is a reallocation of other stocks. Mm-hmm. When most investors get uh, participate in a buyback. They put it in back in the stock market, right. run in another stock. It's a diversifier, uh, actually. So, you know, a company that has great 
uh, investment opportunities, is seeking more capital, and a company that doesn't should be giving capital back. So that's how it's supposed to work. Second is even more basic, and this does not get enough play. The shareholders own earn the money. Uh, they own the money. Mm -hmm. If there's cash on the balance sheet or assets on the balance sheet, the shareholder it's the shareholders. If they choose to move it to, there's only one group that's allowed to get upset at them. If they choose to move it from the company to their own balance sheet, which is not stealing because they owned it when it was in the company. Right. Bonds often, uh, corporate bonds, uh, can have covenants mm -hmm. that say you can't lever beyond a certain point. And if buybacks push past that point, then there's a legitimate argument. Uh, but that's contractual. The 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 bondholders should. And there'd that. be a lawsuit that would and stop that. I think I that's got to be a pretty much a I tiny. I think it's small. Right. Um, buybacks also get a little demonized because, and corporations do do this. Um, for some reason, I do not understand. Uh, they often couple them with the executive stock option grants. What a coincidence. We talked about yeah. before. Uh, and I think there is a little subterfuge going on there. They mm. don't want the share count to change uh, 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 a whole lot and because questions will be asked. I think that's the most valid criticism yeah. is, hey, you're really hiding all this exec compensation by doing a bu expensive buyback. And it jibes with the lying liars uh, right. stuff. Uh, but it is not the buyback per se that's bad. The buyback is still a neutral. They're paying a market price for the security. So there right. I wish people would be more precise. So largely on buybacks, I think, uh, and again, maybe con in contrast to some of my more aggressive things I've tweeted on occasion, uh, I want you to find those tweets. I, yeah. they're, they're, I think you've deleted a bunch. They're, they're, I don't know if they're around where anyone could well, find I them. Well, I challenge you to find them knowing I've deleted them. Uh -huh. that this is part of my strategy. Uh -huh. um, but it, it, regardless, uh, if you look at what we wrote, the derangement we write about is how much people hate them. Buyback it's, derangement syndrome. Yeah, we titled both a uh, uh, an academic paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management and a Wall Street Journal editorial. So that. you know from whence the derangement comes. Yeah, I know. It's Trump it, derangement no, syndrome. No, well, no, no, no. I don't That's mean that. That's what we're playing off By the of. way, it, it used to go back to Bush derangement syndrome. Oh, is it's that, not just Trump. I don't even remember it from Yeah, that. no. Uh, so, you know, when you get older, the memory starts Was it to some go. point there, was, was there a Millard Fillmore derangement I don't, syndrome? That, I'm, I'm not that old. I'm not that much older than you. But it's just all of the anecdotal examples that people my two favorites back in the day uh, dell was notorious for top ticking the market when announcing their stock buybacks but now you have the train derailments yeah. and they had a buyback last year so of course the buyback is the reason why they didn't upgrade their brakes and that example become in it, it sort of colors everybody's here, here you go back to medigliani and miller Mm -hmm. uh, firms should, and I'm not saying theory's perfect, but as a starting point, firms should pr pursue all positive net present value projects. Mm -hmm. And I do think most management tries. I think the short-termism can be exaggerated. Um, so if they need the money, they they, they should be investing. Um, they can raise money in debt. And a lot, a lot of the buybacks, by the way, um, and you could argue leverage has its own problems, but have been uh, uh, corporate treasurers thinking, that bonds were more overvalued than stocks. So they should buy back stock and sell In other bonds. words, during the 2010s, yeah. it's very rational to borrow cheap and buy back stock. Yes, essentially. And and that means, and we show this in our, in our more formal paper, there wasn't room to do it in the Wall Street Journal, that investment is really not suffered on net. You can always pick and choose. And in an argument, every side picks and chooses their favorite examples. This is a company that bought back that then did great. And, right. uh, and, and you know, Apple has bought back a ton and sometimes they're criticized for that. And I'm like, it's, it's worked well, it's out fairly their well. Stock price, right? It's yeah. worked out fairly well <laughs> for them. They don't Same with Buffett. They also well. have a ridiculous amount of cash Apple on the mm -hmm. book. So there's, there's not like they needed the, the, the money. Buffett is a huge defender of, 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 of buybacks. So I think I'm mainly yelling into a void, saying this is just not that big a deal, but it's politically too good for populists of both stripes to yell about, to go away. Huh. Really, really interesting. Uh, last week, actually, I interviewed Maria Vasalu from Goldman Sachs Asset Management, who pointed out that within the small cap effect really is a micro cap effect. Yeah. And if the small cap has, effect has disappeared... Well, first, let's let's talk about your research. Was there ever truly a small cap effect? Yeah, Mar uh, I'll start out saying I, I don't know if I, I don't think I've met Maria, but she's right. Um, was there ever is the right question. There's a little bit of a, a of a 
Keanu Reeves Matrix thing going on uh-huh. here. Is there really a spoon? Red, um, red pill us. Yeah, Tell us I, what... I, are, our our view is there never really was one. Our view is not that there was one and it got arbitraged uh-huh. away, which is a different way to view it. Um, essentially, uh, in the early 80s, um, the original capital asset pricing uh, studies looked pretty good. Seemed like beta was rewarded, and that later got revised also. Mm-hmm. Um, but then holes started appearing in that pure one-factor world. The first major one was that even after accounting for beta, small caps, caps generally have higher betas. They move more. If the market goes up 5%, on average, they might go up 7% um, as, as a group. So you're suggesting it's just a, a more risk, more they're, vo- they're more volatile mm-hmm. a, as a rule. And beta is composed of correlation and volatility. Um, I think it's more the volatility than the correlation driving, but they're a higher beta. Um, the cap M or all theory says you should make more money Uh, if you're higher beta, but not more than that. And the findings were not that small cap makes more money. That's not that interesting. The findings with small cap makes more money than implied by their higher betas, so Mm -hmm. even more. Um, That, over years, some of the work, a lot of the work being ours, but not all of it, has been revised. Two big revisions. uh, The second one we really uh, were a big part of. The first was simply revisions to the databases. Mm. Uh, small cap stocks delist um, more often than large cap stocks. In any study, you need to make an assumption about what people actually got out of that delisting return. So wait, you're suggesting this whole thing is just survivorship bias? A little bit, uh, huh. though Though not you know, with well-intentioned. Uh, people had assumptions for, for delisting returns. The general consensus, and my expertise does not lie here, but the general consensus is they underestimated the negativity of those delisting returns. All else equal, making small cap a little less attractive because your data mm-hmm. has, has not accounted for it a- a- enough. Where we jumped in is, again, remember, we're not talking about the small beat large. We're talking about does it beat it beyond its beta. Uh-huh. Is those betas, uh, and, and we're not the only ones to do this too. Scholes and Williams looked at it a while ago. Those Betas are generally underestimated by conventional techniques. If you do a quant geek's favorite thing, regress the monthly returns on small versus large on the market, you get up a beta more than uh, you, you get a positive beta. Mm-hmm. Small has a higher beta than large. So if you go long, small, and short, large, you have a positive beta left over. A lot of small doesn't trade every day. Right. If you look over a few months, those betas increase. If you if if you do statistical work where you include the response of small, not just to this month's cap-weighted market, but to the last few. It tends to get into the small cap prices slowly, but that's still real. So we've underestimated their betas. If their betas are underestimated, meaning we, we thought they were too low, we've overestimated their alphas. Mm-hmm. Their betas uh, should have been uh, higher. More of their return should be just attributed to the market going up. And... It's not, and basically between those two things, there's nothing going on. Huh. Small caps, and this is not a bad thing. Small caps seem to be priced reasonably efficiently right. versus large caps. One thing I well, will, by the way, that's kind of surprising given how much more coverage there is on on the better known big caps and how often these are orphaned. Well, I, I think that does show up in something you, you anticipated me. I'm about to say, these get confused occasionally. I do think many of the factors, anomalies, effects that quants and academics believe in, mm-hmm. uh, value being, again, maybe maybe the um, the poster child, but not the only one, do work better among small caps. So huh. long, cheap, short, expensive in small caps and uh, certainly has a higher gross risk-adjusted return. Um, net, they're more expensive to trade. I still think that's going to be the truth. The, the case net, but it's it's a little more arguable. But I have no problem with someone saying I love small value because I think value probably does work better. That's in, very in small. interesting. Um, but the the so called small cap effect it often gets conflated with that. It is not small value. It's that small is better than large, and just to- and, and that we're finding is no longer uh, quantitatively. Yeah, we, we supportable. We don't think it's supported at least if you only adjust for beta. Just to make everyone's head hurt, uh-huh. we have an additional paper showing that 
using the more modern factors, which weren't even around in the 80s when guys like Ralph Bonds and a few others were, were looking at the small cap effect. So I can't say they should have used them. Small cap tend to be bad on some of the newer factors. Um, uh, betting against beta, profitability, they tend to be fairly unprofitable. Right. Um, if you adjust for that, they should do even worse mm -hmm. in a modern sense. And ironically, you get back to a small cap effect, but only if you adjust for kind of the full panoply of modern factors. Small cap against the market is not a bargain. What about the micro cap against the small cap? Why um, does that the, seem to have some? Well, it, again, even including that, I think we see most of the small cap effect go away when you adjust for the delisting again and the, mm -hmm. and the higher betas from illiquidity. But whatever, if there's something left, it is disproportionately coming from microcap. That's true. Let's talk a little bit about one of the things we haven't discussed, which is macro. And 2022 was kind of a good year for macro, at yeah. least if you were on the right side of the trade. Um, why? Uh, why? Why was last year so unique? Well, it, it's interesting. We haven't talked. We've focused largely on stock selection and value. Um, a big part of our business is actually macro. Mm -hmm. um, it is... I often say we do less than people think. They think we do all these different things, but a lot of what we do in macro and and I, an early insight of ours, uh, when frankly about 1995 at Goldman Sachs, was if you look at the factors again, it was really value, momentum, and size at that point, mm -hmm. and apply them to macro decisions: what country to be in, what currency to be in. They had similar efficacy. Uh, they worked in a statistical sense. Um, I always say statistical sense. If your car worked like this, you'd fire your mechanic, <laughs> right? If your car works six out of ten days, that would be pretty bad, but it's pretty great as a, <laughs> a, 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 as a strategy. Um, so we've been using value, momentum, even for market direction. Trend has become an increasingly, it's probably the most important part of, of what we do in the macro side, with economic trends, not just price trends, being a relatively recent innovation uh, and super important. And last year, trend following in particular, which is a subset of macro, I will tell you, we mm -hmm. also run some where we consider relative value and carry and other things. But we run some really focused on both economic and price trend uh, factors. Um, that I, we've always described as having kind of a dual mandate. Long term, it's supposed to make money. It's not a crazy thing for an investment to do. Right. But it's supposed to do particularly well in really bad times. Um, this is a managed futures industry, the CTA industry. Trend following has had that property uh, over time. Meaning commodities, currencies, anything that uh, you're buying with futures. Commodities, currencies, equities, bond futures. And we've actually expanded that to what we call a lot of alternative trends, um, more esoteric commodities, uh, yield curve shape trades, even the equity factors themselves, even though we're talking macro, Second show, some derivative. Show, some, yeah, show some tendency to trend. Uh, but that dual mandate is a little bit different than most. Most investments, you would like a low correlation to other things. Um, sometimes you accept a medium or high correlation, but it's mostly about the risk-adjusted return of the asset itself. Mm -hmm. Trend following has always, I think forever, people are looking for both. And it's not free. You can create a higher risk-adjusted return if you don't want to hedge giant drawdowns in the equity market. But this combination has always been a, a, a nice addition of portfolios and attractive to people. Um, it got very loved after the GFC mm -hmm. when it really did what it was supposed to. And you had a giant trend that lasted, yeah. it felt like, forever. Yeah. Um, and, and I should say trend following is not a panacea. You have bolts from the blue. Mm -hmm. Neither of these were very bad for trend following, but they weren't they didn't make it didn't make a lot of money either october 19th of 87 um uh which saw a small trend start to start in about august but not not that much and uh obviously covid was trend following was not how to protect yourself there was no trend to follow right. out of the blue a pandemic hit exogenous shocks but, will do that yeah. but most serious bear markets we've seen um aren't a day they are uh, a few years of pent up uh, crazy uh, or an economic event that leads to a few years the other way. And that's where trend following really shines. The decade after, ironically, pretty similar to value. 
Um, well, not as bad. Trend following simply didn't make a lot of money in the decade after the GFC. Unlike value lost money hmm. um, versus growth. Value loss versus growth. Um, uh, but still, uh, people started to lose interest in it. They got excited after the GFC. And then if there is an insurance-like aspect, which I think there is to trend following, 10 years of a wild bull market, a lot of people start going, why do I need why have I been wasting this money right. on insurance? And then last year, um, I, and not I think it started in in parts of 2021 and it's uh, it's still continuing a, a little bit this year. Uh, but last year was a blowout year for both trend following and um, and even the more general macro investing that considers relative value. And it's exactly the year it's supposed to help in. Um, consider a rival insurance strategy, always owning puts. Mm -hmm. That um, sounds expensive. It, it is expensive. And, and sounds like it doesn't work most and of the time. I've had huge Twitter fights with Nassim Taleb about this. Um, By the way, you and Bose Weinstein both seem to go at him politely about, and you both I, have the mask I, I started jobs out, to do I, it. I did what I, what I always do. I started out politely. It didn't necessarily, <laughs> uh, it didn't necessarily end there. And I will say I think Nassim's absolutely brilliant. He's just also insufferable. Uh, at times, it's a dangerous um, combination. And, you know, I, I may be less brilliant and less insufferable, but I might have some of the same characteristics, which is a dangerous mix when you. The difference is you bring a certain degree of personal humor and charm. Yeah. Well, he can't. Which he, perhaps he, he does not make fun of himself. That right. is that uh, is true. So, so uh, you know, it, we all exist on yeah. a continuum, yeah. and everybody sort of slots in in different places. Absolutely, I, I find you much more. Um, accessible and warm and fuzzy. Listen, his books That's, are groundbreaking. Yeah. He's, we, no one's going to argue that he's not brilliant. You're more accessible on Twitter than he is. I, I, I do try to be. Um, the So a strategy he's been involved with a for a long time that kind of corresponds to his Black Swan book. Sure. Which, it's a very good book. Yeah. Um, it's It basically is a one-liner. Giant things happen more often than, than we expect. Than, quote, normal yeah. model, normal distribution, say. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an important message. He got very lucky that he wrote a timeless message about an hour and a half before the GFC, <laughs> right? Um, but my colleague, Antti Ilmanen, is getting very lucky in that same. He wrote a book called Investing in a Low Expected Return right. Environment right before 2022. So you can write something that's absolutely right and correct, but timing Luck. Dow 36,000. We're yeah. almost there. Uh, when did that come out? Like oh, late 99? At least one of the The book was non. The difference between Auntie and Nassim's books, they're actually real and yeah. meaningful. And that book was just nothing but nonsense. For, for pure fun at the end, you can ask me about that again. But the, the strategy Nassim favors is buying insurance through the options market. Mm -hmm. Tests of the simplest form, as my colleague Auntie has done. Say that loses a boatload of money, including its huge victories mm -hmm. in crashes. I have no problem with someone like Nassim saying, actually, we, we whoever he works with, does this much smarter than right. pure rolling of puts. That's it's not equal of, size every that's year. A form I of bet alpha. there's a million other ways to spin that. But, but he doesn't like the basic finding that Auntie uh, is, uh, that he wants both, and I, I won't give him both. Um, puts work really well in crashes. Yeah. Right? March of 2020, October 19th of 87, uh, huge. Uh, the, the their their leakages in in terms of premium mm -hmm. over the long haul that doesn't have crashes is larger than what they make, uh, and there are some bear markets that they fail to help with. They did not particularly help in 2022. Uh, there was no crash. Too quick. Uh, there, well, well, no, too slow for the puts. Um, in 2022, down 34 percent, and then you snapped right oh, back. Oh, that was March of, of 2020. Oh, 20. I'm sorry. No, I'm you're, sorry. you had I'm it down. right given your time period. Yeah. Uh, the puts helped like crazy then, and managed futures didn't. Mm -hmm. In 2022, managed futures helped like crazy because it was a long, slow you had developing six months thing. to the low in June, and, about. And puts, I don't think, really helped at all. The premiums got very high, yeah, uh, and there was no big crash. Uh, and that's not an environment. If you like puts more than I do, you think the cost is lower, mm -hmm. a portfolio of the two as an insurance product could make a lot of sense because they – hedge different things mm -hmm. puts hedge bolt from the blue crashes uh and 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 trend following hedges long slow crashes i will make the self-serving claim that long slow crashes are tend to be more deleterious to your wealth long term things uh, a lot of short-term crashes reverse soon afterwards they're really about surviving right um 
so so I will make a small commercial for how we do it. But if someone a little bit more reasonable than the seam wanted to go, all right, it is costly, but it's less costly than you think, and maybe we should combine these two. Right. I, I'm 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 wide open to that. Uh, but in 2022, and frankly, I I, I don't think it, you know. Uh, going forward, I'm mildly, I don't do a lot of timing of our own strategies. Uh, I said it's a sin. Um, most of what I recommend is is always having some allocation to trend following. There'll be long, boring periods where I hopefully won't lose you a ton, but won't make you a ton. Uh, that's usually a pretty good time for the rest of your portfolio. Uh, over time, it should add up to a positive, which it has. Uh, and it should help a lot in these one, two-year gigantic uh, events. If I had to time it, I'm a little more bullish than normal. It tends to do better when there's great macro vol, when people don't know what's going to happen. Uh, boring times where nothing is really going on is not your time for puts. And I do think we have, you know, I, I'm a little leery of saying this because I laugh when people are always saying now is special. Uh huh. Um, so it's dangerous to go. We have more uncertainty now than normal, but I do think I'm going to do it. I do think we have more macro uncertainty now than normal. So I, I like it a little more than normal, but mostly our argument is you don't know when this is going to happen. You don't know if we're going to have another two years of this. And by the way, if we don't have another two years of disaster, you're pretty happy everywhere else. So let me let me push back on the more uncertainty. Okay. Because uh, I, I cringe every time I see someone on TV say that. Me too. What, when I gave you a long caveat uh, that I felt you did, bad saying. You did, but, and, and yet you still went jumped I, right I in the hole there. you dug. I did go there. Which is... You know, when do we ever know what's going to happen in the future? When do we have a high degree of confidence? I, I I take the behavioral side, which is when people are talking about uncertainty, what they're really saying is, hey, we're having a hard time lying to ourselves <laughs> about how little we know is going to happen, and we're starting to get nervous. So macro vol might be the good descriptor for that, where you can't pretend you know what's going to happen because it's so... Um, I want to say uncertain, but that's the wrong word. It, you just lose your self-confidence in, in knowing what might happen. Yeah, we're directionally the same. And I, I did also, as part of my caveat, said I still wouldn't time this right. very much. Um, I, I, I do, and I admit, uh, I, 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 want to, I explicitly want to counter the belief that people might think we've missed it. Um, mm -hmm. Managed Futures is it's one in a decade, uh, huge positive. It adds up to good over the whole decade. But it mean reverts now. Mm -hmm. We see no tendency for that really? historically. No, it's a trend following strategy. If it starts to get it wrong, it'll switch its mind uh, pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. Actually, the fundamental trends that we've added in the last five to se well, getting closer to seven or eight years, mm -hmm. um, we think have made the strategy materially better. It's no longer just your grandfather's trend following strategy right. where you follow price. Um, we think that always has a role for a portfolio in a portfolio. We don't know if crazy stuff will continue or we'll go back to normal. Again, if things do go back to normal, yeah, maybe your managed futures don't help you very much, but everything else goes back to helping you. Right. So we, we think the case is at least, let me just be more mild, at least as strong as it normally is, and we think it's pretty strong. Huh, that's really I, I will back slightly off my, my, my sin there of forecasting. So given the fact that you've been investing now for uh, 35 years, something along those lines, in, in your lifetime, have you ever seen a 10% spike in inflation or a 5% rise in rates as an investor? 5% um, rise in rates over long periods, we've seen that, but not anything like the, 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 the recent period, and maybe not even. It's been a downtrend in rates over my career. I'm trying to do right. this in my head. Since 81. I, right? I know for a, a, a fact, because I looked at it recently, that I have not seen... Uh, you know, five, six percent inflation in my career. Um, now, I do think, you know, I, I'd be happy to share with you, uh, quants have some disadvantages. Uh -huh. There's less we can know about any one individual situation than a, than, than, than a, uh, than a more discretionary manager. But we do have one advantage. Um, sometimes they're, they're maligned correctly, but sometimes they're over maligned. Backtests can be really helpful uh -huh. because – just because I haven't lived through inflationary periods doesn't mean we can't look at inflationary right. periods. And that is a quant advantage. And frankly, um, with the exception of the trend following strategy, which I think when giant stuff happens, it does tend to do better. The core stock selection strategies on Auntie is, again, I keep quoting Auntie. You should have had him on instead of me. I, I did. I know you did. I know you did. Um, <laughs> but if I'm going to quote him all the time, why not just go 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 to, go to him? Um 
he has done a lot of our work on showing the environments that factor investing tends to do better or worse in by mm -hmm. factor and as a group. This is for stock selection. And some things, if, if you want to make it a tautology, yeah, when the spreads between cheap and expensive go way, go way wider, value does lousy. But that's a tautology. Macro-wise, there's very little relation. There's very little consistency to it. Huh. Um, that's actually, I think, a good thing. Um, it means if you do this for asset classes, there's obviously correlations. Higher growth and lower inflation is good for stocks and good for bonds. Uh, as they mix up, you can get different results. Low growth, low inflation is dynamite for, for bonds. How it comes out for stocks is a little bit more iffy. Um, but when it comes to factors, doesn't mean there aren't some big factor events, but they occur in all environments without a great pattern. So again, um, we do think we're a pretty good diversifier to a lot of the rest of the world that is much more linked to the macro cycle. So when you're looking at back tests and you're heading into 21 and 22, how are you thinking about the risks? And do you make changes? So do you just suffer through 20 and 21 waiting for 22? Or are you <laughs> gradually shifting the portfolio mix before you, you make it uh, to the promised land? It, it, again, you and I have been bouncing back in a great way between quantitative stock selection and the more macro mm -hmm. trend following. And the stories aren't precisely... The, the same. I mean, it's the six blind men de yeah. describing the elephant, and which is my favorite parable. Yeah. But we're really just talking about different aspects yeah. of what ha takes place in risk markets. It, for value, yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, when when it does look unexplainably after that, keeping that open mind attractive, and we do that sin a little, we do just wait. Mm -hmm. Now. Barry, of course, we didn't sit there in 2020 and say we're going to have to wait. And in fact, it, by we're the way- We're waiting till March 2022. Yeah. Mark your calendars. Well, well, the funny, I saw that tweet from the, you. The, the, well, the <laughs> funny thing is value actually started turning around in late 2020. Mm -hmm. Everyone calls it 2022. That value has been coming back since since COVID started to to, to, to Well, ease. once everything got way crazy by yeah. the end of 20, it's not- This is a little hindsight bias, but- it makes sense for people to start. All right, let's peel yeah. a little off of here and rotate it down. No, absolutely. And but if you go back a couple of years earlier, value spreads were very wide. And we, yeah, we were saying we don't know when this will turn around, but it will. And importantly, on net from here, mm -hmm. saying it'll one day go up again doesn't really help you if it's going to go down more than it's going to go up right. in the future. It has to be on net. No broken um, clocks at AQR. And, is uh, that right? Uh, not this time. Um, I won't say I didn't break other things, but that's just between <laughs> me and whatever's strewn around my office. Um, so value on its own, yeah, well, sometimes we do wait. Catalysts are famously people look for catalysts. Obviously, momentum, both price and fundamental, mm -hmm. we can, you, could, you could lump into the catalyst camp, so we do look for some of that. But some of the things, when the absolute peak occurs, which is a timing level that I think is beyond any of our ability, somebody always nails it ex post, but I don't think anyone can consistently do that. You look at the peak of the tech bubble in March of, of 2000. You look at the peak of the valuation bubble in stocks, which was kind of October of 2020. Why it peaked there, not three months earlier or six months later, even with the benefit of hindsight, I don't think we have great stories. I think when things get egregiously valued, the odds get more and more on your side. Again, good catalysts will help you more and bad will help you less. And sometimes our job is to plant our feet and say we will not move. Now, on the macro trend following strategy, it was a, a better timing story. Again, it didn't make money for a long time, but it didn't lose a lot. And both from some price trends, but I think even more from fundamental trends, we started to see the fundamental trends that could lead to a more inflationary environment. Again, it's not us sitting around making inflation forecasts. We're not macroeconomists. Right. Fundamental trends are things like those actual economists revising up their inflation mm -hmm. forecasts. Uh, 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 growth trends are things like GDP surprises aggregated for the whole uh, for uh, uh, for the whole world. If you're doing the all of equities or country by country, those did a really good job of getting ahead of the inflation that that came. So there, I'll say. On the value side, I'll say we didn't do a very good job on the catalyst, but we did a really good job on sticking with it and it has paid off. Hmm. On the trend following and macro side, I will say uh, I'll give us higher grades on the catalyst side as to the timing. 
Huh. But that's naturally what it's trying to do. Right. By by definition. Re- really fascinating. So the past uh, couple of years, we've seen a huge outperformance of value over growth. What does that mean looking forward? How much persistency does that value advantage have, especially following a decade of growth advantage? It, it, it It's funny. Um, it takes a much longer time for excesses to get squeezed out of the market than people think. Um, particularly if you're on the wrong side of it. You're like, if you're a growth stock investor, the last two years I'm in such pain, this has to be extreme. No, we, again, we start with measures that don't look at returns, that look at the actual valuation ratios of stocks. Mm-hmm. And at the peak of the bubble in 2020, a few months after COVID, it got to by far the widest error, north of the tech bubble. After two plus phenomenal years, it is now at the last time I looked, which was a couple of days ago, it was at the 89th percentile. So still history. wildly. Yeah. Also, uh, tactically, uh, I said, I think I did, I tilted a little too early because I, I went on just value, not on trend. The trend is now at its back. Mm-hmm. So we're at, you know, nothing is a certainty. There can be huge reversals in any trend interim. I don't want to predict the next quarter, uh, but we are still very excited. We're seeing still a mispricing that prior to COVID, I would have considered almost close to tied with the most extreme ever. Wow. Um, and we're seeing the wind at its back. So again, I don't want to overpromise. The short term can always make anyone look silly. But on a few year horizon, we are super excited about value. Huh. So the Goldman Sachs uh, non-profitable tech basket, yeah. and there's another basket of uh, low quality stocks. They've crushed it in 2023. Is this just a dead cat bounce? What does this mean? Is is the cycle changing? Or what's happening in the your least favored part of the market? This is going to be a hard one because yeah. it's confusing. Yeah. And I'll tell you that in advance. But it's it's confusing in a different way, I think, even than you're thinking. Break up what's going on into pure measures of junk. No mm-hmm. valuation here. Uh, low profitability, as Goldman does against high profitability. And Goldman's not wrong about that. They're not surprisingly, the results are right. Uh, low beta against high beta. That we often consider part of quality. All else equal, you'd prefer a low beta. All else is not always equal, but if mm-hmm. you can have less vol and less sensitivity, it's a good thing. Profitability, choosing more profitable and sell, underweighting or selling low profitable. And beta, choosing low beta and underweighting or selling high beta. As a together as a group and individually have had a really bad start to this <laughs> to this year for the exact reasons you're talking about. It has been a junk rally. Now here, I'm hoping to blow your mind a little bit. Go ahead. The way we measure value, and keep in mind, everybody does it a little different. Sure. Every, any, any, you could have 10 great people here, and they're all going to have their own favorite ways. One thing we do is, is since 1995, when we wrote a paper on this, we don't allow value to take an industry bet. We try to make it apples to apples. Okay. Everyone talks about value in terms of like tech versus textiles. You can't fully remove it in a bubble. These are all correlated. But we think value value can be hard to compare. Mm-hmm. Uh, valuation ratios can mean very different things in different industries. So, um, But broadly speaking, our and, – and compliance gets nervous when I talk about performance in, 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 to the public. But I will tell you, value has had a – alone has had a very strong start. Mm-hmm. to this year, which you would not guess if I told you it's a junk rally. Now, so they can happen simultaneously yeah. and perhaps for different reasons. Now, this is actually much more normal. Oh, really? Historically, when junkier, when when when, when uh, profitability and value are often negatively correlated um, because the cheap stocks are often unprofitable. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the profitability factor, if you will, is doing well, it has at least a decent negative correlation. It's been stronger in the U.S. than globally, but it's negatively correlated to value. So what's going on this year is more normal. But that is not what was going on for the prior few years. Value and profitability in particular mm-hmm. were highly correlated because in a bubble, remember, in a rational loss for value, we can do well. Profitability does well. In a bubble, it's not the profitable stocks that are soaring to the moon. It's the story stocks. So let me take the other side Sorry. of the bubble claim and say, hey, stocks got overvalued in 2021, but was it really a bubble? We're down, what, 20% on the S&P, okay. 30% on the NASDAQ? That seems like a run-of-the-mill drawdown sure. and not 
a full-on crash. One of the hard parts is, in a fun way, because they're all relevant, we're mixing a few different things. Mm -hmm. There is the level of the overall stock market and the overall bond market, and then there's internal to the stock market, how cheap stocks did against expensive stocks, right. how profitable stocks did against unprofitable stocks, hedged, without a market exposure. Right. People have used the term everything bubble. Right. Um, Which is really wrong. Everything can't be in a bubble at once. Um, uh, by definition, by the way, the opposite, you can short the value. You know, we were in an, a depression, not a bubble. But there were some correlated things going on. For the mm -hmm. market as a whole, the move in the stock market in one year was big. Not something we don't see occasionally. Not, you know, this is 28 percent is this not is not a Nassim Taleb Black Swan right. moment. The move in the bond market was very big, mm -hmm. closer, but still not a black swan. The move in sixty forty, maybe not still black swan, but was far more extreme than either alone because they happened at the same time. Forty years, eighty one was the last yeah. time you saw that. Again, Auntie will be the first to admit he looks like his timing is better than it really was because he's been saying this for a while. But that was the core of his work. He does a 10-year forecast on the outlook for 6040. What current valuations, uh, call it, it's more complicated than this, but call it the Schiller Cape for stocks, lower expected real returns when the Schiller Cape is high, and just real yields on bonds, uh, yields versus economist forecast of inflation. Mm -hmm. And he takes 60%. His, here's the genius math. To get to 6040, he takes 60% of the stock forecasts, adds it to 40% of the bond forecasts. That number hit the low ever, at least as we can monitor it. I, I won't say the wrong- In 21. Yeah, at the end of 21, call it. Yeah, um, that's pretty I, good timing. I always feel guilty when I say ever. Uh, maybe in the Roman Empire it was worse, but we can't, we can't measure <laughs> right. it. Right, just, just um, towards the end. In though. the measurable universe that we have. Mm -hmm. And 6040, I'm going to try to get this right. Uh, sometimes we talk global, sometimes we talk U.S. Call it, it's made about 4.5% real. Mm-hmm meaning over inflation right. over the long term. That's actually quite a nice real return. We're used to talking about nominal returns make and, and, and almost half bonds. So 4.5% real is a is is, is low very, risk. Those are good very numbers. nice. Um Auntie's forecast, which I think is is quite useful obviously, got down to below 2. It was in the high ones at the end of 2021 just looking at current valuations and saying how does that usually play out over 10 years? By the end of 2022, after all the pain, I think it got into the just about three. Really? Um, which That's is surprising, given that we're now looking at rates in the 4 to 5% range. Well, remember, this is real. Mm -hmm. um, and but inflation is Right up, now, it just gets back to you challenging me on, is there more uncertainty? Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to come up with a really good 10-year forecast of in inflation right now, uh, but certainly positive is forecasted. Mm -hmm. So uh, five, cash is interesting again. I'll say that. Huh, but how really... in, how interesting it is depends a lot on what your actual inflation uh, outlook. Bonds are interesting again. Huh. Um, so uh, basically, the fairly massive trade-off was still only a one-year trade-off after a 13-year bull market. You don't fix uh, – not all of that bull market was bubbly. A lot of that was fundamentals. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that was repricing, things getting more expensive. You don't fix 13 years of getting more expensive – in general, in one year, I'm not sure you want to because you got to go down a lot more than we did. So, Auntie's numbers, which I agree with, uh, instead of four and a half, he'd probably use in the low threes. Mm -hmm. Now, as if you're sitting there saying, "What do I need to retire? What's that number?" Um, by no means are we certain that, that three is irrational. Mm -hmm. That we need to get four and a half. Four and a half, and I know you've heard these arguments, may have been just too good of a deal historically. For instance, for much of uh, that- Are you saying 60-40 has been arbitraged away, or is it just the environment we're in? It it, it may have been repriced, higher That's price fair. to a lower expected return. Here's my favorite argument for that, and it's mm -hmm. it's not a complicated one. Very few people actually got the 4.5% wow. real. <laughs> the cost, That's always true. The costs of investing in various ways were far higher today, and almost all portfolios were not like index funds today. They were- you know, you had a broker who right. bought 10 stocks. There's a lot of friction. So a lot of friction and the effective volatility of your portfolio was double the markets because you owned a handful of stocks. So both the top line was lower because you didn't get you didn't really get it. And second, you were facing higher risks by choice. But the, the index fund concept didn't exist 
for much of this time. Right. So, and even when it exists, the concept yeah. existed, you couldn't execute yeah. on it. So basically, I think the the three today may, this is very arguable, but maybe as good as the four and a half historically in terms of what you get to keep and what risks you have to take huh. to get it. At below two, and this is art, not science, nobody can tell you what this right. number should be. At below two, I and, and Auntie and a lot of people did think that's too low. Yeah, it that's, doesn't make any sense. But above three, maybe I, 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 you know, I, I think Pimco is a super firm, but I hate to give competitors any credit anytime. But uh, but we may have a new normal of huh. lower than normal, lower than historically normal. That's really really interesting. All right, so now I got have you for five minutes, which means this is our speed round, and these answers have to be. Less than 60 seconds. Are you okay. ready? I am. All right. So first, we'll do a, a, a quick three-part curveball, one minute. How early do you pull a goalie when you're down one, two, or three goals? When you pull you pull a goalie, at, if you're down one, at about five and a half, six minutes? In the last period. In the last period. Um, all this can be situational. Our model is simple, right? If right. it's in your own zone, you put the goalie back in for a while. Right. But all is equal. The two-goal result is the one that always shocks people. You pull about 11 minutes. You're essentially paying, playing the last period. You're playing half, more than half the last out. period. Right. And and the idea is you're an out-of-the-money option. Mm-hmm. Um, you, losing by three, four, or five. It's the same. Uh, it may have pride issues, which is not in our model, but it doesn't have standings issues. So, and three, I actually forget the number, but I think it may be before the third period. Got it. Uh, MFA poker tournament in April. Are you participating this uh, year? A, since, about, since the GFC, which yeah. really had nothing to do with it. It was just coincidental timing. I have only played poker in every third year in that charitable tournament. My skills, to the extent I ever had any. They I was, atrophy. I was never a great poker player because I, I, I have a short attention span. Right. And a lot of poker is being Patient uh, willing and... to stare at somebody for seven hours so you can remember <laughs> yeah. what they did six hours ago. Right. Uh, I had fun with poker. I had. I think I was pretty intuitive. I didn't, I didn't lose a ton, but I probably lost money in my poker huh. career. First time I ever I learned poker to play in this Math for America tournament. Uh-huh. I didn't know seven uh, or, or hold them. I didn't well, know how to play. Arguably, it, and my second year I played and I came in second. Right. The worst, I was going to say it. There's so much random chance oh yeah. in it in one tournament. Over time, poker's pure skill. Right. Over anything, it's very similar to investing. Over of short horizons, it's really not anything can but happen. One of the worst things that can happen to you as an investor or a gambler is to get lucky early. Yep, yep, absolutely. The best then, thing for you is to walk into a casino and lose. Then no matter how smart you think you are, you think you're smarter than you, than you you're really are. You're always looking for that hit of dopamine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get you to answer this in under a minute. Uh, Marvel or DC, and what's your favorite Marvel film? Um, I do like both. I'm a, I'm a comic book fan. I was reading them. This is how I learned to read. I'm more of a Marvel guy, mm-hmm. um, though sometimes DC's great. It varies. Uh, who, who current writer crop is better? Right. Um, favorite movies hard, and I, what I'm saying is, if you go find other people who've asked me this, I'm not claiming full consistency. It varies okay. over time. I think the original first Iron Man that kicked off the yeah. MCU is an underrated movie. It's a damn good movie. No, it's a great movie, and not in the MCU. Before the MCU, the first X Men movie, Mm -hmm. I don't remember even how great it was. It was, but it was the first time we saw uh, maybe Michael Keaton's Batman in '89. Right. But for me, certainly with Marvel, it was the first time I saw a superhero movie or TV show that didn't look ridiculous. That looked the CGI and the effects caught up, and it was good. So I think that was a milestone. So those two, I'm going to throw two at you because I think they're they're both. Have a, a so it's a lightning round, but you're disagreeing. Uh, you're well, no, I'm not disagreeing the lightning with you. Round. I'm, 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 okay. I'm pending. All right. Deadpool and Guardians of the Galaxy both have a certain yeah. sense of humor. Thor, that always, Thor Ragnarok too. Always, um, that's right. Always seem to be missing from the rest of the Marvel I, world. I love those. Um, as and and it's not some some people want to be purists and say that's not how the comic books were. They're wrong. If you're really a they purist, had a sense of humor. They had, they were wisecracking during yeah. every fight. So I do love those for the combination of humor. Uh, X-Men didn't have much humor, I'll admit that. 
Uh, Iron Man 1 did, mainly because uh, Robert Downing Jr. is just hilarious. He was great, right. He was so good. Uh, so I do like the ones with humor. So let's talk about favorite books. What are you reading, and what are some of your all-time faves? Can I rant one more second sure. about Marvel movies? <laughs> sure. Um, you didn't ask me what my least favorite are. Oh, go they, ahead. They should find every copy, which is hard digitally these days, uh -huh. of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. <sighs> yeah. And they should bury it in the sun. Let's move on. That's all I want all to right. say about that so one. So you're not a fan of Doctor Strange. Terrible. Uh, I'm a big fan of the character. It makes me even angrier. Let, let's talk about favorite books. What are you reading now? What are some of your favorites? Uh, my all-time favorites tend to be in the sci-fi fantasy world. Not surprising given our comic Are you a big discussion. dickhead? Um, <laughs> I've read a bunch by him. That's one of the odder questions I'll get. Uh, by the um, way, I, I am a self-professed dickhead. I, and when I, I, when I, I say that, people who don't know in, Philip in, K. Dick... In my career of going to comic book conventions... Mm -hmm. I've not heard that term. Oh, used. really? It, um, it's very common on the uh, internet, and it's really the, the one thing fun about him is, uh -huh. is he's written a lot of things that became like famous movies that no one knows. Blade him. Runner, yeah. Minority Report, and, and um, no one knows it's this uh, one the guy. Schwarzenegger yeah. movie they did. Total two of recall. them. Total I mean, Recall. Right. We can um, remember it for your wholesale was the but, but short it, story. I, my my all time choice one is very cliche. Dune. Go ahead, Dune. I loved Dune when I read There are a couple it. of Frank Herbert books that are just amazing. Um, the Beyond first, the Dune franchise. Yeah, uh, it, it, the first two Dune books I thought were great. The first one, much better than the second one. Then they got totally weird. Right. Very messianic, uh, religious, right. odd. That was always um, a thread throughout. Yeah, it was a thread. But it, it but got it be, crazy. It became all that. But I loved Dune. Complex. Yeah, amazing. Rich book uh, you know sci-fi or fantasy sometimes gets a simplistic childish label dune right blows that away um the last movie was the first time i've seen dune reasonable yeah on, on tv don't even start me on sting of uh, uh, <laughs> dueling with these God, made up swords that, that weren't right. in the book um also i'm a big fan of some of the old pulps like the original conan How stories by oh, okay. robert e howard in the mm -hmm. 30s not, we're not talking. I'm not against him, but I'm not talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger's Conan. I'm talking about right, the, book. the stuff that appeared in like weird tales, right. serialized and then became books. I think Robert E. Howard. He unfortunately he killed himself very young, um, mm -hmm. and no one, you know, he, he, no one remembers him. He, and but he, he didn't created, see his own success. No, he didn't. He created Conan, and his writing was so rich, it like mm -hmm. dripped with feeling and color. So I was a big fan of that. This actually segues nicely into what I'm reading now. Go on. Because I am rereading the original basic Lord of the Rings, which you used the term table stakes before. That's yeah. table stakes for a fantasy fan, I read right? that like every other summer as a kid. I, the I, Hobbit, anyway. I, I like The Hobbit. I never liked the full Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. I have, and now? I'm liking it more. Okay. Um, I have found historically I have a small tolerance for 12 pages of Elven poetry, um, which uh, I think Tom Bombadil, for some reason, the character scared me as a kid, even though he's not very scary. Really? So let me ask you this question. <laughs> but because, I'm liking him more now. So so I love both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And while everybody loved Peter Jackson's, yeah, uh, yeah. I thought it was way too dark. Within The Lord of the Rings, within the original, there's a balance yeah. between the hope and the fear. I, I, I think that's uh, that's fair, and ultimately hope wins. So it's, it's, right. it's, it is a positive So they story. take you to this really dark yeah. place. But, it's almost like the ending is tacked on. But, but the, by the way, the going over a minute is completely your fault. So I, so I'll, I own the, it. If you go through Tolkien's experience of, of World War One and then writing in mm -hmm. World War Two, he really had that light and dark right. um, uh, going on. But it was balanced. Um, but, but, but I did enjoy the movies because part of it is just Same. when you've been a fan your whole life, seeing it yeah. come to life. In such um, a glorious way. I do not recommend the extended versions. I, I've steered clear of that because for the same reason. They were already a little too long, and the mm -hmm. extended versions basically, like Bilbo says goodbye 11 times. <laughs> you have like 11 elegiac kind of, I'm not sure I pronounced that right, but he's going away. Um, so I don't recommend that, but I, I do love those movies. I'm reading that now. I'm reading uh, David Rubenstein's book on investing, uh -huh. largely because in May, April or May, he's going to interview me. Oh, great. Which I'm terrified of because he may have seen some of the things I've said about private equity over time. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding. He knows about those. He still wants to interview me. But i got to be prepared for that one. He could care less what I, you think about I, private I, equity. True. Can I say that? That's, that's a, I mean... Uh, yeah, there, there are people who are, you know... Whistling. And I use the phrase wrong. It's actually could not care yeah. less. But everybody says could care yeah, less, yeah, which, yeah, is, no, uh, no, which annoys no, me. No, you're, All you're right. right. Our two adult questions we save for oh, the very okay. end. 
What sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad interested in a career in value investing, quantitative finance, or even academia? Um, in broad general, a financial career, I'll I'll, I'll go with. I, I I don't like either. And if someone tries to only steer you to lucrative careers, that's not a happy life. If people mm -hmm. only steer you to find your bliss. Um, well, if you're not the best in the world at your bliss and the bliss doesn't actually pay you anything, it's not, <laughs> it's not such a great <laughs> um, thing. I got into finance because I liked it, because um, I worked for these professors. I found it interesting, thought I'd be a professor. That Not everyone has to follow that route, uh, but you want to blend those two things. The only concrete advice I'll give people, um, young people, and I say this all the time, is try very hard not to chase what's currently hot, mm -hmm. particularly starting out your career. Um don't try to be suicidal, um, uh, uh, but but going into what's currently hot, you're going to be five years off every time. Right. Um, so I, I would back off that. And if someone is really considering uh, a, a career in value investing, I, I recommend investing, as I said earlier, at least half your time in building up your psychological endurance level. Because uh, you, you're going to you, need it. You think it's all about balance sheet and income statement analysis. Uh, no, about half of it. Is, is the right personality and the, the right emotional makeup and the right partners. Our final question, what do you know about the world of investing today? You wish you knew 40 years ago when you were first getting your feet wet. Going back, there's always been this tension in academic finance and, and in applied uh, quantitative finance in why these things worked. And we talked about it very briefly earlier. Um, if you find, if someone shows you a great back test, there are really three possibilities. One is it's gibberish data mining. <laughs> and let's assume it's not that, that they've just tortured the data. Let's assume you think it's real. It can work because you're taking an actual rational risk and being compensated for it, mm -hmm. or what's called often called behavioral finance. Some people are making errors. Uh, I often take uh, two Nobel laureates, my Gene Fama as one end, and uh, Dick Thaler, also mm -hmm. at Chicago, as the behavioral guy. There are a lot of other great people in this field. I don't mean to make it so... Uh, these two, but I would say you, you could do worse than those two. I, I, yeah, absolutely, and I'm a fan of both. Mm -hmm. um, if if you ask me who I think is more right now, like I think Gene's contributions are actually the biggest in the entire world of finance because mm -hmm. a lot of the field wouldn't exist without him. Um, but that's a different question of who's right. I think I would have been 75, 25 in the Gene camp when I left Chicago, even finding momentum. And now um, you've flipped? And now I think it'd be 75, 25. And all that means is more of why our stuff works, I think, is taking another side of behavioral biases than a rational risk premium than I used to. And we're all a prisoner of our lived experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, living through both the tech bubble uh, and and the, those last five years, uh, to, to and change terrible, to and change very good. Um, all that... It may have over influenced me. You know, sometimes you see more crazy events in in a career than right. the average. Uh, but I've definitely moved. I, I, I still vote Gene the MVP of academic finance throughout all of. Again, I'm impugning the Roman Empire throughout all of history. Mm -hmm. uh, but I probably uh, have have moved more towards the behavioral side. Uh, that someone's got to be on the wrong side of the trade, and if you quantitatively identify who that is, they seem to work very well in harmony. Absolutely. Uh, Cliff, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Cliff Asnes. He is the co-founder and just general all about town uh, managing principal at AQR Capital Management. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the previous ones we've done over the past nine years. We're coming up on almost 500, and you can find those at YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow Clifford Asness on Twitter at Clifford Asness, and you can check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts at Podcasts. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. Justin Milner is my audio engineer. Atika Valbron is our project manager. Paris Wald is my producer. Sean Russo is my head of research. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.